All right, welcome to the Chief Optimization Officers podcast. In this episode, we're going to aim to talk a little bit about outsourcing, what it is, why it is, where it is, how it is, and when it is. I'm Vicky Jakes. I'm Sam Jacks. So, Sam Jacks, I have a question for you. Why do you keep referring to the four hour work week every time we talk? And then you call it the Bible as well. I do, yeah. Do you want to talk about it a little bit and why you love it so much? Yeah, I like it for the frameworks mostly. So I I first picked it up in about 2009 and then didn't touch it for a couple of years. I then revisited it after reading Brian Tracy. In fact, I didn't read Brian Tracy's Eat That Frog. I listened to it on audio at two times speed whilst on the way to a course about time saving and optimization running late um, ironically how did that sound because brian tracy's got the funniest voice right he kind of talks like this so on double speed that must have been hilarious it was hilarious it was a course on optimization and process optimization and standards and, and all this kind of thing standardizing and i was there lying in bed with a a girlfriend uh, at the time and was not motivated to get out and go to work. Let's just leave it there. And I realised I hadn't done this sort of home pre-work for this course I was supposed to be on and was an hour late for the course. (laughs) But what I learned that day and what I learned from that book was like, oh, any problem you're going to come across, someone has fixed the problem before. And I had this four-hour work week and I just so happened to be going on holiday. So I read it. Like you do, sitting on a sun lounger, drinking beers and whatever else you do on holiday. And it blew my mind because I recognized so many of the frameworks in there. There's a couple of frameworks in there, but there's one of them, which was this deal framework. I think he calls it delete. Yeah, D for definition. So let's have a look. He's got it in the content page here. So he says definition, elimination, automation, and liberation. So that's what he does. A couple of reasons that I liked that. One, because... When you are doing process optimization, first thing you need to do is define the process, write it down in the current state, and then you want to eliminate all the waste and then you want to optimize it. He was talking about applying it to a business system and I'd seen these same frameworks work very, very tangibly in a manufacturing setting, making products, specifically making fighter jets and bits for fighter jets. And I was like, Oh yeah, the title suggests the four hour work week. And then he uses some like, the the reason I never read it was like in the first couple of pages, he talks about the new rich. And I was like, I, at this point, I was well versed in sleazy salesmen that were selling, you know, Forex trading and that kind of thing. So I was reading this with a, a big dose of cynicism, let's say that. But then when I saw that, I was like, oh no, there's some science behind this. And then the other thing that for me lent a lot of credibility is whenever you're designing a complex system, a big project like a aircraft carrier, like your billion pound projects, huge, huge projects, what it comes down to, there will be a contract that identifies terms and all this stuff about times and who will do the work and when the work will be done and the reviews. But the other big part of that contract, one of the big references in there will be this requirement set in this statement of work there will be this huge requirement set and it will be legal wording the system shall be gray the system shall operate at this voltage the system will comply with iso 9001 the system will be ce marked and the rest of everything you do for the rest of the project comes back to these definition of requirements then you design each one of those requirements you explain how you're going to test each one of those requirements and then ultimately that's what you deliver against you know, so long as your whole system does that, you met the contract. I mean, there's a bit more to it and there are downsides to that, but I never ever come across that as a framework for designing your life and for ultimately designing how to get rich. And the reason I call it the Bible is because the Bible survived thousands of years. Whether you believe or not, I would say I'm a skeptic believer. Whether you believe or not, it's lasted thousands of years because it's based on story and story transcends generations and is is a great way to learn lessons and you and I have both commented gone Tim Ferriss yeah didn't he do some Latin dancing 
like because that's how he opens. He opens with a story about competing in some world stage dancing, nothing to do with for a work week, but it's that hook and the storytelling. So that's why I make the comparison. It's frameworks and stories for designing an optimized life. That's what it's for, which might include getting rich. <laughs> so at the heart of it, the book isn't about doing a four hour work week or creating a four hour work week for yourself. Like that is like the ultimate goal, like the Valhalla, right, of, you know, what an entrepreneur wants to do is you want to make money without working, right? But essentially what he talks about in the book is how you just need to work smarter, not harder, and you need to look around and utilize the resources around you, the things that you're good at, the time that you have available, and use those things in a much more effective, clever manner to be able to create more time in your business. And if you can create more time, then chances are you can also create more more revenue with like the, the better systems that you set up as well. You know, it's very attractive as a title. He lives it as well because he, he actually went around the world, as you said, and created these businesses. Yeah. Well, he came up with the idea on a massive sabbatical, right, around Europe or whatever. And he created this time for himself to think about the, you know, the systems and the, and the businesses that, that he'd like to have in his life. But, you know, was able to pack lecture halls and fill a book up with them and you know, create like an amazing podcast and kind of whole business out of it, essentially. But it, it just always comes back to how to optimize better. Yeah, he's talking about a complete paradigm shift, a fancy way of saying a, a pattern, a way of thinking, a shift in a, a change of a way of thinking, because the socially acceptable way of thinking is, well, I work full time, five days a week, about 40 hours, and I get an outcome, I get a standard of life. And he's saying, well, why? Why play that game? And so I think if you're talking about optimization of something that already exists, you're talking about condensing down the four hour work week. And there's a big difference between optimizing a 40 hour work week into less versus what, what he advocates in here, which is, no, I'm gonna design from the ground up. And it's a big shift. Like I only want to work four hours. And the title, like, let's just be really clear. The title is great copy. It's a great hook that helped him get the message out and sell a load of books. That's the purpose of the title. It's not to say that you end up working four hour work weeks. The, the purpose of the book, in my opinion, is to explain, look, there is a framework and a mode of thinking that allows you to live a life on your terms. To, to design that life. And the reason I like it is systems and software design is all about patterns. You have design patterns that you follow for software. You have design patterns that you follow for system in the same way that neuro-linguistic programming, CBT, uh, I mean, neuro-linguistic programming, a bit of a pseudoscience, but quite effective. Tony Robbins leverages it to great effect. And there is a level of science in CBT, well, a lot of science in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. These are just patterns of thinking and the thing that blew me away at, at this time was I was learning about patterns for manufacturing multi-million pound platforms that are at the cutting edge and had this interest in business and was like, oh, there's these patterns that work for business. And it's not just patterns of behavior, it's patterns of thinking. It's a logical process. And then there are patterns for a happy life, for living a life. Because at, at this time, I was having a big conflict between like, seeing these guys and girls that were like on the executive fast track development program, which was where I was heading. And they were getting to like 30, 32, no social life, burned out, committed to the company, having to travel all the world, maybe one divorce under the belt. Not saying that divorce is a bad thing or shouldn't happen. Just saying like, well, that's, it's not an ideal pattern of life if that's what you want to shoot for. And I was like, ah, oh, that's a conflict between like, I really like working hard, but I'm not sure I want to do it that way. And it for me, it was just like, well, let's just rewrite the rules of the game on your terms. Why did you want to dive in on the four-hour work week? It's because there's one part about it, which I think is like really, really relevant to what's going on in my life at the moment. So I've been thinking a lot about some of the things that, that Tim Ferriss talks about in the book, in particular, the Pareto principle. Right? So, you know, 80% of the things come from 20% of the things, essentially. And when you look around in life, you just see that everywhere. And like, you know, we see it every day in the agency, like 20% of the ads do 80% of the work, essentially. They bring in 80% of the revenue. I mean, it's not exact, but when you look around, you can see in your business, you've probably got 20% of your clients bring in 80% of the revenue. 20% of your employees, even if it's just two of you, 
potentially 20% of the work that you're doing is bringing in 80% of the revenue as well. And so if you can think smarter about where that energy is going in your business, whether it's the tasks that are happening, whether it's the people that you're dealing with, whether it's the systems that you're setting up, is the chances are 20% of one of those areas is going to create an 80% output approximately. Right. The reason why I'm quite interested in that at the moment is I'm trying to think about how to do the most with the time I have available in my business. And I've been looking at outsourcing and getting more people in and trying to understand who is going to look after that work and do they look after the 80% bit? <laughs> like, Or do I find a way of giving that 80% worth of work that isn't going to make all of the business, you know, just focus on the 20% that is going to, you know, create like a lot of revenue potentially or a lot of output. And that is just taking over my life at the moment. Last week when I chatted to you, what's taking over my life is creating new systems. And now I'm like, well, who do I delegate to? How do I grow my team? And I, I'm in a position like many people where I can outsource but probably not employ as quickly as I want to just because of the type of business that I've got set up. Why would you take on that risk? Well and this is what Tim, Tim talks about in the book right you know he advocates hiring contractors so that you don't have to take on that risk and finding the right people to do the right jobs for you as well. Again, it's all about, all about thinking smart, not thinking harder. Like the, the kind of traditional element is getting people bums on seats into an office, being generalists. But actually, if you could get a specific person for a specific type of job, could you create more output? Could you create more revenue? I love that about the four-hour work week. Yeah, definitely. I'm having a lot of big feelings over here because I expect this podcast to do well, not because we're great, but because we're talking about a trend that is going to grow. That We're, we're going to ride the wave of a, tr a macro trend that is, is kind of coming up in the creator world and the solopreneur world and the single person business world. Because what we're talking about is everyone in your system is essentially plugged in via their laptop and you just want to pay for an outcome. You don't want to pay for the liability of, well, what if that person's off sick? And like we spoke about the other week, why it's not efficient to employ people. It's the same reason it's not efficient to be employed. And so you're happy to pay a slight premium to outsource for a person to know that you can have them on demand, more or less. Like if you have a bit of work dries up for, or whatever happens, you can go, well, I can just cut that cost tomorrow. I just go, well, we're not doing that anymore. And you don't have all the non-value added work. And I really want to come back to this non-value add term. Before we do, let's just go back. Pareto's principle, 80-20 rule. There's an awesome Tim Ferriss interview again with Richard Koch, K-O-C-H, British guy, which makes me like him even more. And he, very, very credible. He's got an MBA from Oxford University, went to the Wharton School, which is in the States, joined the Boston Consultant Group, and then co-founded LEK Consulting. Not sure who they are, what they did. Interesting guy, because essentially in all his books, he's like, yeah, uh, he, he's very well-spoken and very well-to-do. Uh, you know, he's he's been to Oxford, so <clears throat> excuse my northern take on him. But he's like, yeah, working hard, just do the things that get results is essentially his approach from what his book's about. And he invested in Betfair early on because he essentially says you only want to do the value add things. In, and then he also talks about markets that where you're a market of one and all these other good terms. So if anyone wants to really read on the 80-20 rule and how to apply it, really recommend his book. It's called 80-20 and he's got about five or six different books, which are all about the same thing. That one's really good, Richard Kosh. And if you haven't got time to read or just want the free version, listen to his interview with Tim Ferriss. Awesome. When we get to like talking about your system and, and people and like where you're at, a system has, when you define, when you do the definition bit of the current system, you, you, you end up with these tasks and they're broken down into value add and non-value add. And it's always phenomenal to me that you end up with usually in an organization of 300 people, about 1% is actually doing the value add. So let's give a, a real example. You have an organization that's a, a specialist organization in making uh, aircraft training equipment, let's say. And let's say they make training simulators. You will have someone that 
is responsible for project management. You'll have someone that's responsible just for management of the people. You have someone that's responsible for commercial management. You'll have someone that's responsible for quality. You'll have someone that's responsible for insurance. You'll have some systems engineers that write all the stuff down. You'll have some software engineers that create some software. And then you'll have a person that takes the CD of software, puts it into the hardware and fires the thing up. Everything that isn't, write the software and put it onto a bit of hardware so that someone can use it is non-value add. Like those first five, six, seven, eight roles that I spoke about, they add zero value to this process. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because often where people start with outsourcing is I have all this stuff that I think should happen and now I'm going to try and offload it to someone. And for me, the first thing to do is to sort your own diary out. Not to say you specifically, Vicky, but maybe, I don't know. Oh, all right. We shouldn't, you shouldn't, you should, you should look at it, it's horrific. <laughs> you know, a lot of time is spent on doing non-value add work that could be offloaded. And so in my opinion, the place to start is to figure out what the value add tasks are and then to look at optimizing those to be outsourced because there's a whole load of wait and time and everything else. Yeah. Well, I, I think like for me, like with the Tim Ferriss four hour work week approach, right, is if I was starting my agency from the ground up again and starting all over again, surely it would make sense to remove myself from the business as much as possible. So I could get because I do a lot of I'm, I'm in the business. So I do a lot of client management. Right. So I'd pay more to get someone in to do that kind of job. And then I could just do the sales, I guess. But then how do I decrease that time that I don't need to do the sales? Okay, well, is there like a system I can set up and automate it? And maybe I can hire a copywriter to write my copy for me and then I can put it in there. And then I guess at the kind of the bare bones of it, I've got a system where there's sales copy, someone can post it on social media for me, Perhaps my four hours are spent going, doing interaction with people and doing social selling. And then someone buys something for me, that goes into a system that onboards them. And then that goes through to a human being who can then like output and deliver the work, right? And potentially, I, you know, like I, that would work. I could do four hours a week of that. But it doesn't take four hours to get to that point. Right. You know, it's like there's so much work that needs to be done up front. Right. And I think that's potentially what is missed about the four hour work week is it is really difficult to find someone who you can trust and outsource your business to who doesn't work for you, who's not going to nickel your clients and run away with them right? You've got to set that system up. <laughs> You've got to train someone in your tone of voice to be able to write copy in a way that people believe it's you. You know, like there, there is like a, a lot of work up front before you can get to that Valhalla. Yeah, right. So we should definitely get into like who, what, why, when and how, because there's some real tangible things. Like if you're in a business doing like 50 grand a year and you're suddenly going to spend 10 grand a year on a virtual assistant, like that's a big chunk of cash. Just to wind back a little bit, I think this is why productized services are so attractive because there's very clearly an approach here. So this, is, this is my opinion of the approach to take when you're considering what to outsource. When you were talking then, you were talking about, okay, well, what are my four hours a week doing? And when I think of this role, what are they doing? And there's, I've got this really old boring book I think it's out of print now. This was a former mentor gave me this. It's called Understanding Organizations by a guy called Charles Handy. How understanding the way the ways organizations actually work can be used to manage them better. And essentially, like we go through these cycles of people designing organizations in certain ways. They design them around people and they design them around process and then they design them around customer outcomes. Then they design them around structures and systems. Like there's a million ways to go at it. My opinion, for what it's worth, is we need to figure out the approach that is most optimized for the outcome that's making the most money and growing at the moment. And the outcome that's making the most money and growing at the moment is online so solopreneur, single person businesses. So that's the thing to, to optimize for. When we have to consider what are we optimizing for, well, we're optimizing for the time of that person and the money that they get paid. Okay, so how do they get the money? Well, they get the money from a user experience, from providing either a product or a service to a user. So what we need to understand is what is the most efficient way of the user getting the value? 
Because if you look at Ray Dalio's stuff on how economies work, he essentially you know, makes the point that over time, all we are seeing is this linear growth of people adding more and more value into the world. So what Tim Ferriss is banging on about is the four hour work week. That would be the equivalent to saying the 30 minute walk when you've got, you know, walks usually take an hour because you've still got to design this system, which is a car, you know, it takes all that time and effort. And the reason I'm trying to identify this and, and perhaps I'm muddling up my train of thought here, but we, we've got this user experience to achieve, which is discover you and then they buy your product and then they, they leave you a review. Like that's the user experience. And currently we have a method, let's call it a digital marketing agency of, of serving that user experience. And you're doing a load of activities to, to serve that user experience. And the approach you're taking at the moment, or you, you mentioned was, you're going to try and chunk that into well, what's my four hours and what's another person's role. And well, I'm saying, forget that. What are all the activities that need to happen for that customer in the most optimized way, which is why it helps to get definition around, well, what is the user experience, the value add bit? What's the value you're adding into the market as opposed to all the content that's being created? How are you doing the sales? How are you delivering the product? Like, forget that. What What's the user's benefit? And, and I think getting down to that is also helpful for the sales copy. If you are a business right now who is thinking, how can I be more like Tim Ferriss and the four hour work week, right? What we're saying is that the four hour work week is the place you want to get to. In the meantime, you have to put time and effort in into setting up that place where you aren't needed as much to do all of the things in your business, right? And one of the ways that you can do that is by thinking, how can you provide the most optimal, happiest experience for your customer and then designing the system around that? I guess what I'm trying to say is you can only optimize for one thing. So if you're an agency, what, what's an agency? It's a bit of graphic design, a bit of copywriting, some paid ads, some emails, a website. I'm, maybe I'm generalizing, but you, well, you can't optimize for five things. It needs to be for, for a result. It's, it needs to be a single thing. Like I get you this, Alex Hormozy says this, for it to be a, for an unbeatable offer, it has to be so disproportionately valuable. You're not comparing it apples with apples. You're like, well, this, this clearly gets me the result. And I think that has to be defined rather than saying, how do I do what I'm currently doing more efficiently? You need to define the outcome you want, which is, okay, I want this many customers to pay this much, this often, and I only want to do this many hours a week. Like that has to be defined. Otherwise, you're just making a continuous improvement on, and that's a different approach. You're just trying to improve what you've already got, but what you've already got isn't necessarily what you want. Okay. So, I mean, is it fair to say like that anyone reading the four hour work week, like shouldn't look at that as a way of improving an existing business? It's about how to set up something from scratch. I think you could apply some of the techniques to improve your business if you wanted to. I think it's written to do something from scratch. I mean, isn't there someone in here that like set up a Bible application in Spanish or something and they're not religious and they just went, right, I want this much money. I want an app, right? Filter most popular apps in the app store, Bible. Okay, there's no copyright law on the Bible. Are there any good Bible apps in Spanish? Well, let's have a look. Okay, didn't know these are all crap reviews. Right, I'm just going to build that. Hands off. Now they're a millionaire. Yeah, like I guess like that's why there's the rise of the drop shipper as well, right? Because drop shipping as the sector of retail is you can do it from anywhere. So you don't need premises. You don't need an office. All you need is a laptop. You need a supplier. If you can find a supplier in China to keep costs low, you know, that even better. And then all you need to do is make sure that supplier sends the customer that buys your product on time in good enough nick. So your function then becomes marketing your business. You could use Shopify, maybe run some ads. There you go. You've got a business in a box there. And, th you know, that's been super, super attractive to many because of that. And so then the idea becomes how do you find a product or a new emerging product that can go viral? Explodingtopics.com if anyone wants to look at topics that are exploding. Hard kombucha was exploding recently. Heated blankets. So you post well. 
yeah, yeah. I actually did a um a Google Trends search for electric blanket yesterday and noted the pleasing graph, the pleasing way the graph went upwards, which is quite funny. But it's the ultimate Tim Ferriss four hour work week business, the drop shipping business. I think that sucks as a business. I hate drop shipping businesses. <laughs> Because you're not in control. Sorry, we're getting off topic on outsourcing, but... I think, well, no, but I think it's worth just talking about it. Like, as a business, it promotes bringing in crappy products. It promotes plastic use from that point of view, from an environmental point of view. But yeah, if you were looking at it in making money, what happens when your supplier decides to sell via their own shop and not use you? to sell the products anymore. And you've suppliers that you're across the full spectrum of your business. You have suppliers of customers as well, the the ad networks that you have to buy from. Unless you're doing content marketing and the margins can be crap and your currency can go down and you can have that issue. There's so much complexity. And if you're optimizing for being a business owner, and let's just be very clear, like the four hour work week, the premise of that is you are a business owner, not a business operator. You are not trying to design a job for yourself. You are trying to design being the owner of a business. It's a very different game to play. I also think the whole industry has been glamorized because there's a few key actors in it who have shown how you can earn like a million dollars a day or whatever and have made it out that it doesn't have that complexity in there. When that happens, that is the lagging measure that an industry has done is... You have a few people who make a load of money, and when they stop making money, they go... And then they put a course out about it. (laughs) How do I sell a course, and how do I become a consultant and get other people to do it? That's the first indicator that an industry is a bad one to get into. And then when it starts, when stay-at-home mums and dads start doing it, you know it's really finished. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of, so so one of the things Tim Ferriss talks about in the four hour week work week quite a bit is being able to get comfortable with outsourcing and outsourcing, like as in paying people to do some work for you, but paying people who are overseas, right? And paying people where it's not going to cost you as much compared to paying in your local country, right? And, and, you know, he talks about the the gig economy and using freelancers that way. And I've been using sites like Fiverr and Upwork for for quite a few years, actually. And they are a great way of being able to find low-risk, short-term contract experts in a lot of the technical space. So if you need someone to just fix your website quickly or upload 100 products onto your drop shipping website or maybe set a quick Facebook ads campaign up for you. You know, you, you can do that. But I'd like to say I've had lots of experience, but it's not always been easy, right? Because finding someone is like kissing frogs, you know, you know to find that the, the kind of the prince, as it were. Not everyone is as good at what they say they are. <laughs> Otherwise, they might have a full-time job, right? So they're out there hustling hard on Upwork. They're hustling on Fiverr. They're competing on price. How do you find good contractors, Sam Jacks, to kind of help you in your business like this? Because one thing, knowing where they are, then knowing if they're any good, and then knowing how to manage them and make sure that they're giving you the right output. And I feel like TF, Tim Ferriss, in the 4-Hour Work Week, kind of skirts over that bit a little bit. He doesn't talk about that side of things. I think he just sort of says, go and hire, go and outsource, it'll be really easy. Yeah, right. So there is another book recommendation coming, Virtual Freedom by Chris Ducker. I've bought it and read it and audio booked it. If you want job descriptions, frameworks and how to hire, that's the place to go. I'm not going to try and paraphrase it. I'm going to just call from my memory bank, which is made up of my experience, his book, Tim Ferriss's book and everything else I've read. For me, my approach of hiring resources, first of all, I don't hire on typically on short-term contracts to do one-off jobs. If you are having short cycles of specialist work that is not an optimized business, you want boring work that is repeatable. That's a business that's a sustainable business model. If you're doing something specialist that you need to hand off one off multiple times, there's risk associated with that. And we could analyze the whole reason that's an inefficient business. So I don't tend to do that unless it's a big ass project and the prize is worth the pain and we're doing some genuine R&D. That's a different scenario. First thing I would say is Tim Ferriss does, to, to be fair to him, I will defend him. I will defend the business Bible. He does say, go experiment. 
first of all. So I would strongly advocate the best way to learn is to go try it. I do believe that apprenticeship is the way to learn how to action knowledge. A study is the way just to acquire more knowledge. So when you say go try it, what do you mean? Do you mean go and hire someone? I would go hire a VA for a couple of days a week. If you hire a Filipino VA, $4 an hour, you're talking like 250, 300 uh, pounds a month. So who should do this? Someone that can afford to write off around 10 grand a year that you can say, I'm going to dedicate this money to learning how to manage someone. Because the thing that gets overlooked when you outsource and delegate is you create a new role for yourself, which is to quality check and manage someone else. And that gets forgotten about. I've given it for them to worry about. But actually, you need to now have write yourself a new job description, a new set of checklists on how you are going to look after and manage that person. So I would advocate that. I've done it a couple of times. I had an Italian girl who was based in the UK at £25 an hour, very expensive, wasn't great. No, but she was all right. I wasn't great. I didn't give her the direction. This is the case. Yeah, because we hire them and we expect them to manage themselves because we're hiring them, right? But actually, it's like any other business where you hire someone and bring them into your business. You need to communicate the business values. You need to communicate the direction. And you need to talk about the purpose of the task that they're doing. If I'm honest, I feel like the values will come across in the actions and how you conduct yourself. I personally, get when starting out, I would like, just get started and figure it out. So I would hire that person, a, a Filipino VA or, or someone from from India or that part of the world, which is me being really ignorant, there's a whole load of countries over there where labor is a lot cheaper and you can hire someone from $2 an hour to 6 or $7 an hour. I currently have an Indian writer. I'm paying him like about $8, $8 an hour, I'd guess, maybe a bit less. And he's awesome. And I provide all the tools and whatever else. Um, go, go try it. With regards to what you get them to do, I just so happened to have written this down as if we were expecting to talk about this. So to begin with, you, you want to be making a list of all the tasks that you don't want to be doing. And, and I wouldn't worry about getting this right to begin with. You just want to get started. Write all those tasks down. And then what you want to do is open up a, a Google sheet. Just, just write them all down. Give them all a title, bit of a description. And then you want to roughly say, or oh, when do they need doing? Do they need doing daily, weekly, monthly? Or are they completely random and ad hoc? And so you then end up with this list of tasks that you know how often they reoccur. Is it weekly, daily, monthly, or what you would like them to reoccur? And then ad hoc. And you can then create this sort of calendar. You can roughly estimate how long they take, which, and let's just be clear, that's an estimate because you're probably wrong, but don't worry about it. And from that, you can start to templatize, well, this is what a working week would look like. And, and my uh, advice would be that the, at the beginning of the day, people are usually more focused than towards the end of the day. So you want to put the beginning of the day as all these reoccurring tasks. And then the end of the day wants to be blocked time for ad hoc. And then you want to cap either end of the day with, at the beginning of the day, you want them to say, hey, I'm online and I'm working and these are the tasks I'm doing today. Confirm that, that that's understood. And at the end of the day, you want them to report that those tasks are done and you can quality check them. And then a couple of times a week, you want to like put in an hour where if they've got any blockers and they've been unable to do a task, they can address that with you. And then it's like, well, how do you convey how to do that task? Well, there are, there are two applications I would advocate. Next time you do that task, and it's very important that you or one of your team can do this task, you open up Loom, which is free, and for five minutes, so maybe you'll need the paid version, and you open up uh, an application called Tango.us, and that records, they, they both record everything that happens in your browser, but Tango.us will record every button click, everything you type, it, it records everything. So you'll then end up with a, a video overview of everything that happened in Loom. You can add that to your spreadsheet as a hyperlink, and then you can add a hyperlink to the Tango standard operating procedure you've just created, which is editable. And then when you give them their standing working week, you will then have these tasks with the ability on how to do them. And you might need to delegate access to certain applications. You can do that again for free using LastPass. So, and you then maintain security control and you can delegate if they need their own account, you can create a Google account. And that is how I would advocate getting started. I would just get started just a couple of days a week. So, you know, you're talking $5 an hour for 16 hours a week. What are you talking for? $80 a week, which is about 80 pounds a week at the moment because the pound's in the toilet. That's how I would advocate getting started. With regards to finding a person, the way I do it is 
I chunk down the task that I want to employ them for into the smallest possible component. And I say, I want this outcome. Before we start, please tell me five things that you will need to do to achieve that outcome, how long it will take you, and what the tangible artifacts, the email, the file, the digital attachment that you are going to give me at the end of it. Please tell me that, and I will pay you just to write that down. I will just want a plan on a page from you. I'll pay you an hour just to give me that plan on the page, just to check their understanding. And if they can't do that, don't pass go. And then give them this test task. And I would test them. People advocate doing interviews and skills tests and blah, blah, blah. Nah, like give them the task and test them on the task. That's a waste of time and money though, isn't it? Because if you, if you don't do some type of screening, you could just end up with someone who, and I've had it before where they're like, oh, this is my first job. So you're giving, well, I don't want to be someone's first job. Do you know what I mean? Even if it is cheap. I guess it depends on what you're looking for. I, I find often those people like this Indian guy, to be fair, it was actually a friend of mine that employed him for his first job at $2 an hour. Okay, so you had a recommendation. Yeah, so you had a reference there. But you just got to test them. Yeah, but I, I do believe, I think you do need to have some type of quality control. Like if someone is going to go into your Facebook ads or Google ads account, for example, you want to know they're not going to go in there and delete everything or nick your credit card details or, you know, things like that, right? If someone's going to write copy for you, you need to see examples of the copy they've written previously. If you need someone's doing video editing for you, image editing, anything that has an outcome you'll want to see a portfolio i think yeah or, or ask them to do a test set i mean on the so people quite often get hung up on like protecting details and whatever else is a reason to not outsource uh, most bank accounts now will allow you to well, create that's what last pass is for yeah exactly you can either last pass it you can create digital copies of bank account cards so that they're just for online transactions. You can create pseudo email addresses. But to go back to what you were saying before, like Tim Ferriss says, you know, when you walk 10 miles, it, you know, walking at four mile an hour, it's going to take you whatever that is, two and a half hours. And he's like, but you can do that in 10 minutes if you've got a car. So just get a car. It's like, oh, hang on a minute. I've got to build that car. Like that's, that's what the four hour work week is. It's like you can do it in four hours, but you've got to build this system. So just going back to that, yes, absolutely. And that will feel inefficient. Because building a system, you are building something that is non-value add. Your customer doesn't care that you've done it. You, No one's going to pat you on the back for it. You are only doing it for you. And so it can be quite difficult to stay motivated to do it. You're only doing it for freedom. Uh, and then what happens if someone does do the task, but it's not up to par? So you've got to go through and do changes and give feedback and yes yeah, so you've created a, a new job for yourself yeah and um, but but that comes down to i think you can only optimize for one thing you're optimizing for the customer experience when you get them to do the job you have to be specific about the outcome so if it's a creative job that there has to be an agreement that they will rework it till it's good enough and you want to remove yourself if it's client work then ideally you want the client to say when it's good enough if it's you testing it then let's say it's on a Facebook ad, you're saying your graphic has to achieve this click-through rate, this conversion, whatever, before I'll pay you. Like that, that has to be part of the deal, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so much complexity to hiring freelancers but you don't know them until you start hiring them and then you have to figure it out as you go I think it's easy to say you need to define the outcome for whatever task it is we were just talking about the agency and ads there right but like you can say here's the outcome of the task I want and I'm not going to pay you until I get this outcome but what if they never quite get there what if there's a breakdown in communication what if they disappear because their mum's sick you know or whatever right there's all that kind of human element that kind of come comes into play there you've got to move on it's like doing sales you have to go through a lot of rejection to get a sale not because the thing isn't worth buying just they don't want it like and, and it's the same with contractors that i mean the coaching guys strategic coach have this saying you want to work with people that come batteries included and for me that just like hits the nail on the head Yes, and they're not just going to be out there immediately as soon as you find them on Upwork and Fiverr. You know, I, I do believe, like, to your point, asking for recommendations and trying to find people who have a good reputation with others is a great way of being able to improve the efficiency of using that person. 
Yeah, I think there's no substitute for going out and trying to do it. I'm, I'm just thinking back, it was a project I've gotten at the moment and I needed some specialist software skills on it. I must have interviewed 20 or 30 people and that isn't an exaggeration. And I had one guy who got pissed off because what he was suggesting wasn't possible. I explained that to him, gave him a load of information. He signed my email up, he reported me. He, he, he got really nasty and horrible, like a bit of a horror story, because I said to him, okay, I'll come back to you. And it was clear he wasn't getting the work. So you weren't even rude to him or anything? No, no, no. It was all completely cordial. He just wasn't a very nice person. I'm sure that I wasn't completely blameless. I'm not saying I'm a perfect person, but it got really horrible. And all I can say is I went through a lot of people all around the world because it's a very specific niche skill I was looking for. And I paid each of them about 50 pounds every time to like, look, give me half an hour of your time. And all I want is your plan, the five outcomes and what you're going to deliver. And I just want to know how you're going to do this because I know enough to know what the outcome should be. There's no substitute for doing it. But the reason for saying like that's bad business is because uh, I wouldn't advocate that unless there are like millions of pounds potentially on the other end of it, at least hundreds of thousands of pounds. I think if you're looking at a virtual assistant who's like 10 grand a year, then you want to keep them around all the time. This particular bit of work, I needed like four weeks of effort and that was it. So it's a very, not a scalable thing to do. I think it's also just worth noting as well is that there, there's not an all one size fits all, I think, from a developer point of view or from a virtual assistant point of view or even from a copywriter point of view. You know, you might want a virtual assistant who's who understands the drop shipping world, right? Because we've been talking about that. So to get one who only does book who specializes in bookkeeping is probably not going to be right for you. Granted, they'll probably learn the SOPs and everything, but actually, if we're talking about hitting the ground running, you may as well find someone who is experienced in that field. Same with developers as well. Like if you're going to get in, you know, because God love developers, you know, they, are, they can get a bit stuck in their ways. I will fight anyone who says that's not true, right? Developers and engineers were socially stunted. <laughs> <laughs> we're socially inept like we're not good at that kind of stuff no and you know having worked with many 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 developers over the years to say to one could you just figure out this bit of language that's not your core competency it's, it's not in your stack of skills i'll get laughed out the room so you know you've got to pick the, the right person for the right job in that sense. So if you've got a WordPress site and you're asking a Shopify developer to come help you, it ain't going to work. And same with copywriting. If you're going to get someone who's really used to writing sales copy to come and write your ghost, write your book for you, that might not be the right thing to do. You know, so you, I think you, you do need to think about that outcome up front. And you, sometimes you do need to hire the specialist rather than the generalist. Yeah, you've got, you've got to know what your outcome is. Uh, so let's give some summary takeaways. Another recommendation. So you've got to have the expendable capital to test this out and not need the results. So do not spend any money if you need the result to happen, like 100%. That would be my risk-averse caveat. If you're going to test this out, go test it out on the cheapest virtual assistant you can get your hands on because you're going to make a load of mistakes. That would be my advice, or, or at least mid-range. Something you can afford to lose. I would advocate that if you're at the bottom end of a budget, you know, you've only got 10 grand a year to spend, let's say, there is a course that you, I would recommend buying for your virtual assistant, the Digital Business Manager Bootcamp. It's about five or 600 quid for clarity. It's, so I know the founder, uh, Dea, founded the course, and there is a library on there of people that have completed the course who are digital business managers, but they're at like 40, 50, $100 an hour. So if you've got lots of money, and you can afford, essentially, you don't want to hire a COO, but you need someone who can think for themselves that will design this work week, that will design all the systems, and you just want to say, hey, here's my business, it works, please go figure it out and run it for me. That's the place to go. So if you can spend rather than 10 grand a year, 100 grand a year, or somewhere in between, that would be where I would look. But you still have the same process to go through. And I would still say you want to practice managing people. And ultimately, scaling business, as we said previously, is about being able to find really good talent and hire them. 100%. And so, yeah, definitely go and kiss a few frogs, I think. Go and see what is in your business that could save you, when you're looking at the 80-20 rule, you know, could save you the time so you can focus on the 20% activities that are going to bring in 80% of the revenue or create 80% of the work or whatever. Ideally, tasks that are repeatable, 
so you don't have to keep going through the hiring process. You can kind of keep that person on a retainer. That said, though, I'd say Upwork is quite handy. I, I have like several people on Upwork who I have contracts with, but I don't always have to pay them all the time. It's just whenever I need them, I can just go in and unpause that contract. So I don't have to pay them for like work that I can't give them at any moment in time. You know, I think that the biggest takeaway is that you have to get to a place where this system becomes designed, right? You, it doesn't just happen immediately. You, you don't just get to stop working tomorrow, only work four hours and have all this money magically like rock up into your account. <laughs> we want to design a business that you own. So imagine you can't work in it. You then have to design all these roles, all the software they'll use, all the tools they'll use. You need to know how many customers you need, how many products you need. Like It's a big design job, and you could spend a couple of months working on it. Mike Michalowicz, who I was talking about last week from Clockwork and Profit First and everything, he was talking on a call I watched in the past week about how he refers to himself as a shareholder. When people ask, what do you do? He doesn't say, like, I'm a writer or I own this business or this business or whatever. He just says, I'm a shareholder because he wants to act like someone who has invested in a business and talks about the analogy of, like, how he has shares in Ford. But just because he's got shares in Ford, you won't see him rocking up at the Ford plant building cars tomorrow. Well, how can I add value? How can I do this? You know, he's given his money as an investment at risk because he could lose that investment at any time so that he can make money back and that should be the aim for all of us as business owners is to invest in the case we've been talking about here is time and money to kind of find people to kind of help us with our businesses so we can step back enough to have these so-called four-hour work weeks where perhaps we only need to rock up a little bit to work on the business not in it yeah the the goal becomes, you know, deploying capital. I mean, that's a uh, rich dad, poor dad, isn't it? Quadrant four. You ultimately want your money to make money. But at the moment, we are still in the, the phase of we're trading time for money and using money to get other people's time. That's the phase we're in. Well, you know, wish me luck because I currently hire five contractors and my time is very busy doing the work, managing those guys. And so I'm like next level where I need to find someone to help me manage the contractors now. But, you know, it's all a process, isn't it? We should definitely, definitely get Daya on from Digital Business Manager Bootcamp because as she's been a part of companies that have gone into the tens and hundreds of millions as the operations person and now teaches people to do that people come find us come say hello on twitter yeah well you should because i don't have a desire to find people on twitter but you're going for forty thousand people at the moment so pitch your wares sam jacks yeah i'm, I'm trying to build the personal brand and yeah come say hello on twitter sam jacks j-a-double-x sam spelled exactly how you'd expect uh, and i just want people to and, like and don't sell it to vicky because she don't want to talk to you <laughs> No, I just want people to like and subscribe to this podcast, please. And go share it with all your friends and tell everyone. Do that as well, please. Yeah. yeah go tell everyone uh, how awesome it is. All right, cool. <laughs>